Thank you. Hi. Hi. How are you? Fine. How are you? Thank you. Are you ready? Great. I am always ready. Yep. Excellent. How are you guys? <laughs> Look at that. Are you excited? You don't know about what, right? Okay, so thank you for that introduction. I didn't understand much. Uh, I did understand my name, so that was good. <laughs> did he say I was brilliant? Okay, good. So my name is Rami Avidan. I'm the CEO of Tele2 IoT. So I don't need to ask the question about Tele2, right? You all know the company Tele2, right? Isn't it the phenomenal company? So, um, Valdis, where are you? Are you in the audience somewhere? Yes. Where is here? <laughs> there, the CEO of Tele2. He is fantastic, I can promise you that. Um, so, um, we are going to talk about making the world a smarter place. And we're going to talk about IoT. How many of you have actually heard about the concept of Internet of Things? Raise a hand. Okay. Some of you, very good. And the ones of you that didn't raise your hands, shame on you. <laughs> right? Uh, IoT is at the epicenter of everything that I do. And I will share some of the things of um, what IoT actually is and how it is going to make the world a better place. And so let's start off with a definition of what is IoT. And so this is how we... Did it come up? It did. This is how we define IoT. IoT is part of a digital journey. You've heard a lot of people around the world talk about the fact that we need to digitize, right? This is not only happening in companies, it's happening in our countries, in our cities, it's happening in our daily lives as citizens on this planet. And what is IoT then really about? It is about automating real-time information to be able to, in a very simplified manner, allow systems and systems and systems and people to decide upon actions. Okay? So when you think about IoT, it's actually not about technology. It's about what the technology can deliver. And so let's take a look at some of the areas where IoT is making fundamental changes. Okay? How many of you are traveling frequently with airplanes? Raise a hand. Let's say maybe once every three or four months. Okay, a few of you. Okay. So, the Top left one, have you ever seen one of those before? A green button, yellow button, red button. And when you travel, and I uh, don't know if you've thought about it, you know, you come to the airport, you go through customs very often, then you go through security. And when you go through security, the people working in that security piece of the airport, they're very hard, they're angry, they open your bag and they throw you out, and you feel like kettle, right? And so a company based out of Croatia, called Happy or Not, decided to try to change behavior. So what did they do? They built this little machine with these faces on it, with different colors. And then they went to the airports. And they spoke to the airports. And they said, don't you want to improve the customer experience of actually coming and utilizing the airports? The airport said, yes, we want to do that. How should we do it? So what they did, they went and very often at these airports, the security personnel at the airport is actually not an employee of the airport. They're insourced from a security company. And so what they did, they linked the results of the happy or not technology to the bonus of the security personnel. Aha. Uh -huh. So, the more green faces, the more money in my pocket as a security personnel. Now, you can imagine when you travel, they're all smiling. <laughs> Have a nice trip, sir. Can I help you? Can I carry your luggage for you? 
Can I offer you something to eat or drink? Well, maybe not that far, right? But, but you can understand that here we have technology changing behavior. But it will only change behavior if you've implemented the technology in the business process. Make sense? Did you understand that? Yeah? I'm not going to go through all of them, but of course, uh, the other one that I want, and these are, by the way, all Tele2 customers, right? Uh, I had to say that. Uh, the top right one I really like from a personal perspective. This is more from an altruistic angle, and this is a company that focuses in on delivering solutions for donations. And you know, normally you, uh, when you donate, very often you, you have people on the street with these little boxes and you can put some money into the boxes and you always walk past them, right? Very rarely do you actually stop and put money in. When they digitize this process, they increase the donations with 75%. 75%, why? Because it changed behavior. It wasn't a person, you weren't drawn in by a person. You saw this machine, you got interested in it and you said, you know what, that's a cute idea. I'm going to donate, right? So you can use technology to change behavior, and that's fundamental. Then, of course, IoT is used in many other areas. You know, we're tracking elephants and giraffes in Africa. We're connecting up big ports. The port here is the port of Rotterdam, right? Uh, so, you know, it's not only about changing behavior. And we're going to come in just in a few seconds talking about how and where you should implement it, and why, what the, wha what, what the actual values are in then. So talking about Tele2 then, um, you obviously know that Tele2 exists here and across the Baltic countries, but of course Tele2 also exists in many other markets. As a matter of fact, we still have eight countries where we run cellular and fixed line operations, both B2B as well as B2C, and it's a rather large company, right? And we've done phenomenally well. Did you actually know the Tele2, as a group, is one of the best performing mobile operators in the world. As a matter of fact, we're top five on shareholder value creation over the last 20 years. And I think that's pretty damn phenomenal. And the way we've done that is that we are challengers. We don't do things the normal way. We do it in our way, in the way we believe creates values for our customers and our partners, right? And so what we've done very often is build up a business, and when it's big and strong enough, we've sold it off. Right? That's the basic history of Tele2. And at, the, at Tele2's height, it was in around 30 markets around the Eurasia footprint. Then Tele2 IoT, the business that I'm then the CEO of, we started the business five years ago. And today it's around 200 people serving customers in 165 countries. And when we talk about customers, we don't necessarily talk about a general telco B2B customer because they are typically much, much smaller than our customers. Our customers typically have thousands and thousands of connected assets around the world, right? And so we've obviously grown extremely fast over the last years. As a matter of fact, 16 to 17, we grew with 98.5% year on year in revenues. Now, that can tell you a little bit about the adoption of IoT around the world, right? It's growing at exponential rates, and happily enough, we're, we're growing together with it. Now, why do we see such high adoption? Well, it's on the back of the fact that there are a lot of macroeconomical aspects that are taking place that I don't think that we think about all the time. How many of you have heard about the overshoot today? No hands? Seriously, guys? No hands. Okay. The overshoot day is the day in the year where we consume more of the world's resources than the world can produce. Okay? And for every year, we lose a week. Okay? Now, what that tells you is that this is not a sustainable situation. We can no longer allow ourselves to consume the way we consume. We have to change it. Now, the way we're, not, the way we're going to change it is not going to be about 
telling people that you're not allowed to eat foods anymore, you're not allowed to drive your car anymore, you're not allowed to travel on airplanes anymore. The way you have to do it is that you have to become much more efficient. And I will come and talk a little bit later on how we are going to become more efficient doing it. But just to give you a snippet here, are there any people in the audience from any white goods manufacturer, you know, washing machines and dishwashers? No? Okay. Let me tell you a little bit of a secret here. We happen to have a lot of these guys as customers. Now, when you buy a washing machine, let's use that as an, as an example. How long does a washing machine live typically? Seven to eight years is the average for a washing machine. So it's not a bad, it's not a bad guess. Now, why do you think that it lives for seven to eight years? Because they want you to buy another one. That's how they make their money, right? Now, as it happens, I happen to know that they can actually build a washing machine that lasts for 20 or 30 years. Now, imagine if they would do that. What would it mean to that business? It would dramatically impact their business negatively if they remain with the same business model. But if they change the business model, their business model today is what we call a linear business model. They build and sell a product. And when they've sold it, that's it. At best, they might, say, they might sell some spare parts. If they moved over into a circular business model, where they actually don't sell the washing machine, where they sell a service of what the washing machine delivers. Now, what happens? They're going to go into the holy grail of revenue, which is the recurring revenue, i.e., every time you sell the service, you're building up a revenue stack of users using your solutions. Now, of course, in that model, it's in their interest not to actually produce another washing machine, because they want you to be able to use the same washing machine, the same cost for a much longer period of time. That's how they will make their money, right? So what we're now seeing a huge trend of is a shift from these linear business models into the circular business models. Make sense? Do you understand? That's when you say yes, we understand. OK. Good. Now, of course, there are lots of other macroeconomical aspects that we also need to understand, right? We're living longer. We're becoming many, many more people on this planet. And we're becoming sicker, right? We're actually not becoming healthier, although we believe we are because we live longer. But we live longer for a lot of other reasons as well. But we also have a lot of new diseases that we have to take care of. Now, these are exponential problems. And exponential problems needs exponential solutions. Now, technology is not the only solution available out there, but it's absolutely a big part of solving some of these macroeconomical aspects that we're seeing around the world. Now, let's focus in on a, a B2B for a bit here, right? Now, if we go back to the white goods manufacturer, right? They're going to make this shift from selling products to selling services. That is fundamentally going to change its business, right? It's going to fundamentally change everything about them. It's going to change how they sell, to whom they sell, how they deliver, how they produce, where they produce. It's going to change their profit and loss statement. It's going to change their balance sheet. Right? This is an arduous and very, very difficult process to go through. It's not a simple matter. Right? And I know one of the topics at this conference here is about Okay, what now will happen when these companies are going to be forced to make this shift into services, where they're going to deploy a lot of technology in their organizations? Isn't that going to mean that a lot of people are going to become jobless? So, just to touch upon this for two seconds. Number one, this is not happening overnight. This is not something that is going to, all of a sudden, you're going to wake up one morning and all companies around the world are digitized doesn't work like that, right? This is an iterative process that happens slowly but surely. One thing I can guarantee you is that unless the companies actually do digitize, they are no longer go going to be with us. How many of you remember the company Kodak? Kodak? Yeah. Okay, most of you remember Kodak. Now, do you remember 
What happened to Kodak? There was a type of technology that they didn't adopt. Anyone remember? The digital camera. They resisted the digital camera because of the notion that, well, this is going to fundamentally change our company. We're going to, to get rid of people or retrain them or how are we going to do it? What happened instead was that the whole company folded. So the message here is there will be a shift for people. There will be the need for retraining. Someone who's today working on a factory floor is now going to have to, to learn computing. They're going to have to be able to maybe manage a factory floor from a computing perspective. Do we believe that this is going to dramatically increase the unemployment rate? Absolutely not, because there are going to be an enormous amount of jobs created by the digital process. An enormous amount of jobs created. So there will be, however, a big shift from what they do today to new types of jobs. And now that is really what is going to happen. Now, we talked about this arduous process from moving from linear business models into circular business models, right? Now, we have hundreds and hundreds of customers around the world that have started and implemented th these types of changes. And so, what we looked at was those companies that have started doing it, are there any common denominators, a red line in all of those companies? Can we find a model? A formula for success. We call this the IoT winning formula. Okay? Are you interested in finding out what the formula is? Okay. So I'm hoping that there are a lot of um, executives from um, businesses in this room today, but because what I am about to share with you is the secret source of the companies that have actually been doing this transition and implemented these type of technologies and become very, very successful in doing so. Okay? Are you excited? Yes. Okay, good. He's an excited man, I heard that. Okay. Basically, there are five things. And yes, you can take photos if you want to, no problem. Look, first, it's about finding a team a person, a leader, or a couple of leaders that will become the internal heroes. We call this innovation on the edge. What this talks about is that when you want to make fundamental changes to your business, you can't do it in the middle of your business. Because if you do it in the middle of your business, it's going to be bogged down with all of the bureaucracies and processes and structures of the existing business. Because what you're embarking on here is a huge change. You're going to fundamentally change your business. So you have to do it on the edge, and you have to create a team of entrepreneurs that are sitting outside of the company or on the edge of the company to be able to ignite and start this change process. So that's the first thing that all of these companies did. The second thing that they all did what that was that they had complete and utter buy-in from all top management. And even if there is someone in the top management that actually doesn't agree, he or she will have to get in line. Because if you, if you don't achieve that, and you have people in management that resist the change, it will never, ever happen. So that's the second thing, complete and utter management buy-in. The third thing, and this is where most companies fail, is to think about this from a longevity perspective. You have to look upon this as an investment to stay alive and to become an even stronger company in the future, not as a short-term cost. This is not a cost. This is like going to the gym, right? You don't go to the gym once, and <laughs> you shouldn't go once, right? You should go frequently. That's how you become strong and healthy, right? It's not about eating healthy foods just one week. You have to do it long term. You're investing in yourself. And this is the same for companies, right? 
you have to look upon this from a long-term perspective. The fourth, what will happen when you start this shift is that someone is going to ask you for a budget. That sounds all great. Let's go and do it. Show me the numbers. The only thing I can guarantee you is that whatever that budget looks like, it's going to be fundamentally wrong. Because no one has any idea of how the end result will actually look. So what you will have to do is to plan for flexibility. You have to plan for scalability. Because the way that this works is that you're going to have a big plan, huge vision. But then you have to start small. And when you've understood the business models and the technologies and how you're going to take it to market, <coughs> excuse me, you're going to scale fast. Right? That means that you have to think about not locking yourself down with huge investments into technology or hiring a lot of people. You have to allow yourself to stay nimble, to allow for, you, for your company to for a very long period of time, be very agile. So scalability and flexibility are crucial for these companies that have been able to be successful. And then finally, of course, it is about connecting the dots. And now what do we mean with connecting the dots? Number one, it's about you are not going to be able to do this yourself. You're going to have to build an ecosystem of lots and lots of different players around you to help you go on this journey, right? We call this connecting the dots. That means that you're no longer going to have vendors selling you stuff that you're going to have to pay a lot of money for. You're going to reverse the model. You're going to create partnerships. You're going to demand the vendors of today to take the risk with you. Because, of course, if you are willing to take the risk, and they are going to benefit from that. They should share the risk with you. So this is about finding the right type of entities that want to be on this journey together with you. So stop thinking about vendors and start thinking about partnerships. What type of entities do I need to interact with to be able to deliver the end result that I'm uh, hoping for? Make sense? OK, that was the IoT for, uh, winning formula. Now, why are companies implementing this? There are four reasons for it. Yes, historically, it was because they wanted to become much more efficient. They wanted to be able to improve on their existing operations of their companies. Right? Automating. Right? You think about robotics on factory floors, for example. With robots, there are less mistakes. Right? Simple as that. There are no unions. Robots, they keep on working. And yes, there is a higher investment in the beginning, but long term, of course, the marginal improvement is dramatic, right? So, of course, it was about becoming much more efficient. But, of course, as these companies implemented these types of technologies, they also realized that it's not only about becoming much more efficient, it's about finding new revenue streams, moving from that linear business model into the circular business models, right? Going into services. Right? Now, when you go into service, of course, when you don't longer sell the product, when you sell the outcome of the product, of course, you need to have a very clear view and understanding of the quality of that product. Right? And that allows and means that you have to have a very strong handle on the service that, you, that you're offering, because you're now going to have to deliver an SLA, service level agreement. You're going to have to promise certain quality. So what happens automatically is that you have a dramatic increase of the quality that you're delivering to your customers. And that leads to the fourth very important value of why companies are implementing these things. And we call this customer intimacy. Customer intimacy is really about, and you all know companies such as Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, right? Right? Yes? Okay. Now, what is it that they actually do? They make money on knowing everything about every single one of you. They are able to monetize the information that they have on you. That's their customer intimacy. Right? They know 
before you even know it yourself, what you will want tomorrow. And the way that they calculate that is through statistics. Because they have such a huge number of customers that they can amass all that information and get a picture of the future. Now, customer intimacy is going to be fundamental, especially for companies living in the Western world. Historically, we've been talking about, you know, the Indians and the Chinese manufacturers. Yes, cheap, cheap products, but pretty poor quality. No longer the case, right? Today, cheap products, but very, very good products. So the only way that Western companies are going to be able to stay competitive long term is, of course, if they have a very strong relationship with the customer, where you build customer intimacy. Now, that we believe is going to be the true value that is going to be created long term when, Im when implementing these types of technologies. Now, let's quickly take a look at one industry that has been doing just this without you even thinking about it. Are you excited? <laughs> okay, good. Look, the automotive industry. Most of you here in the audience either own a car or have access to use a car, right? You've heard over the last couple of years, all of the automotive manufacturers are talking about carpooling, car sharing, autonomous driving cars. And what they say is, we're doing this for the environment. We're doing this for less deaths on the roads, right? That's what they're saying. But what is the underlying reason? Why are they doing this? Why are they spending billions and billions of euros connecting up all of these cars, trying to change the business models? Is it to be nice? Of course not. They're doing it to make more money. And the way that they're going to make more money is in a couple of ways. Number one, they're going to be able to monetize their core asset, the car, not only from transporting you from point A to point B, they're going to be able to monetize for services during the transport from point A to point B. And B, of course, if you think about how these OEMs are selling their cars, they sell them through dealers. And 98%, I think, of all of the car manufacturers don't actually own their own distributors. Now, when I buy a car, and yes, I do from time to time, the way I do it is I have a dealer, and John at the dealer, he is my dealer. I like John. We have a nice time together. We play golf once in a while together, right? He invites me when new cars come in to the, to the showroom. I get to drive it. Maybe I bring my wife, and we have a nice little jolly ride. He throws in those extra winter tires. Now, if John today sells an Audi, then they decide to change brands to BMW or to Volvo. There is a very high likelihood that I will actually change brand because my relationship is with John. So what they're trying to do here is to create customer intimacy. Make sure that you as a consumer of their product are staying close to them as a brand rather than to the dealer and to John at the dealer. Right? So this is about ensuring long-term sustainability of their business and to be able to increase their margins long-term. Make sense? Scary sense, but sense, right? Now, the way that they're going to deliver on this long-term, of course, is that they need a lot of technology. Why? Because to be able to deliver on autonomous driving cars and services in the car and car sharing and car pooling, they need real-time data. They need real-time information on what's happening with the assets that are delivering the service. Now, for that to happen, then, of course, they need a lot of technology to be implemented. And, of course, all of the vehicles need to be connected, right? Using the Tele2 infrastructure. As a matter of fact, do you know that we have here, I think we have now, close to 5,000 Audi cars connected on the streets. which is pretty damn phenomenal. Across Europe, we're catering to around now north of half a million connected vehicles. 
which is pretty damn cool, right? So these things that we've been talking about is not only a vision or a story that may or may not happen. It's actually happening right here, right now. And so it's time for you all to, if you haven't already started looking at it, to actually do just that. So finally, going digital is happening right now. You know, if you think that this is not going to affect you, let me just tell you, it will 101% affect every single one of you in this room in one way or another. That's just a fact. So instead of resisting it, try to embrace it. Now, if you're a business and you're thinking about this, it's important that you find your winning formula. Now, the five things I've talked about are just very high level. You, you will have to, of course, go very deep into your own organizations and understand what this will mean to you. But finding your winning, winning formula is going to be fundamental for you. And finally, you know, this is about customer information. And the more real-time that information is for you, the more accurate your predictions will be in the future, and the better your company and stronger it will be in the future. Thank you very much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed it. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Rami. Thank you. Rami. Thank you. Can we have a, a look uh, of what has been said? Because actually, we asked the audience uh, just before your presentation uh, just to say, say a word uh, what does it mean that a perfect uh, customer service, an excellent customer service. <coughs> Actually, the main words are attitude, empathy, a smile, a satisfaction, understanding, care, everything else. Do we have a comment on that regarding the IoT? Look, I think um, could all those things could be delivered by the perfect. Ab absolutely. Yep. Sure. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I mean, uh, look, I think um, IoT will for sure be able to affect all of those aspects in so many different ways. As a matter of fact, do I have 10 seconds to tell yes. a story? OK. So, uh, and please don't get upset now. So, you know, I was speaking at this other event a couple of weeks ago, and it was in Stockholm. And we had, uh, we had the event, and I was speaking, and everyone was really happy. And then this journalist from the Baltics, I won't say which, uh, which country. But you can imagine now which one it is. Um, Not me. We had a press conference. And I said what I said today. I said, this is going to affect everybody. And it started everywhere. And he said, it hasn't started in the Baltics. <laughs> and I said to him, really? Oh, that's interesting. How, how did you get here to Stockholm? He said, I, I took the airplane. I said, OK, great. And how did you get to the airport? I took a taxi, he said. I said, OK. I said, how did you order the taxi? Well, I used my app. And I uh, pressed the button, and the taxi arrived. Now, how do you think that works? In the taxi car, there is a little device with a SIM card in it. When someone in their app presses the button, goes a little signal to the taxi car saying, please pick me up here. And then when you leave the taxi, you pay with your credit card. Same solution, goes to your bank, takes money from your bank account, transaction is done. IoT. He didn't ask any more questions. Thank you. Rami. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you.